What are some of the rocks in America right now that young people are in danger? You know, I talked to a man just a few weeks ago who claimed to be an atheist. I don't know whether he was really an atheist, but he said he was an atheist. He said, I've been an atheist all my life. He said, my father was an atheist. He said, I am now 71 years of age. And I said, what do you have to look forward to? He said, nothing. He said, life has been miserable for me. Well, I said, why don't you give up your atheism? Why don't you believe in God? He said, my pride won't let me. Their rock is not our rock. Compared with Paul, the apostle Paul said, I've fought a good fight. I've finished my course. I've kept the faith. Henceforth, there is laid up for me a crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, will give me in that day. Secondly, young people, many young people are going after materialism. They've fallen for the materialistic God that says things are more important than anything else. I find across the country today a deep economic discontent among people. I find it in Europe. I find it around the world. And people are wanting more and more things. And we forget that we have the highest standard of living the world has ever known. We still have poverty. The government is trying to do something about it. The church is trying to do something. Hundreds of social agencies are trying to do something about it. But the people that we call living in poverty would be considered rich if they lived in Bangladesh or in many other parts of the world. We're a rich nation. But still with all of our riches, we're dissatisfied. We want more, 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 more. The more we get, the more we want. Jesus said you cannot serve God and mammon. He said a man's life consisted not in the abundance of the things that he possesses. A famous man was quoted in the paper the other day as saying, I'm worth millions of dollars, but I can tell you this, that's not where it's at. I'm worth millions, but that's not where it's at. Adolf Burl, in his study of power, points out riches make people solitary, lonely, and often afraid. Many times a rich man has a loneliness and a fear because you see, if you make riches your God, if you make things your God, if you make money your God, it leaves you empty. George Bernard Shaw said, there are two tragedies in life. One is not to get your heart's desire, and the other is to get it. You think if you had a lot of money, you'd be happy. Some of you have already got a lot, and you're not happy. Two tragedies. You didn't get it, and you did get it. You see, without God, Life loses its zest and its purpose and its meaning, even though you may have money. Young people in America today are revolting against affluency. And yet today, many young people are prisoners of a culture which puts a premium on things rather than moral values. Their rock is not our rock. Don't make money your God. There's nothing wrong with having money if you've got it legitimately and honestly. It's what you do with it. It's your attitude toward it. Do you love it? Has it become your God? Does it dominate you? Does it have such a hold on you that you don't have time for God? Their rock is not our rock. That's not the rock we want. What are the objectives of the average person in America today? Power, pleasure, leisure, money. What is the objective of a Christian? To glorify God. To live for God to do the will of God, to love your neighbor, to help your neighbor, to make an impact in society for God, and to leave the world a little better place because you were here. What is your objective? Is your objective to get all the leisure time you can, to have all the pleasure you can have, to make all the money you can make? What is your objective? What's your goal in life? Where are you headed? Their rock is not our rock. You know, in America today, we're searching for new thrills. We've worn out the old amusements. You're not to become so absorbed. The Bible says be temperate in all things. There are legitimate pleasures that can take most of your time and occupy most of your thinking that are legitimate in themselves, but they soon become sin because they've taken the place of God. In thy presence is fullness of joy. At thy right hand there are pleasures forevermore, said the psalmist. Do you have that kind of pleasure? The kind of pleasure that's not dependent on circumstances, 
the kind of pleasure that's not dependent on how you feel, the kind of pleasure that runs deep, that has been brought there by the Spirit of God. When the tide comes in, the rock of pleasure will turn into a sand. The sweetness of pleasure turns to bitterness and disappointment. Life becomes empty, sick, and a tragic thing. When pleasure is put first and becomes your God, their rock is not our rock. There's the rock of revolution. All over the country we hear the word revolution. And many young people have fixed their hopes and their dreams on change in the political system. And they believe that if they can get this revolution, it'll fix everything. I was with one of these young leaders whose name is known to many of you in New York some time ago. And I looked out across Manhattan, he said, we're going to burn it down. I said, what are you going to rebuild in its place? He said, we haven't gotten that far. I said, well, before you destroy the American ship, you better be sure that you can know how to build a raft. Many people have an idea that they, I think they, it's the excitement of revolution for revolution's sake. You know, every utopia has turned out to be a pipe dream in the history of the human race. Their rock is not our rock. Yes, we need change in America, but let's keep our freedom. Let's don't have revolution just for revolution's sake or we will destroy everything that's been built in the greatest nation in the history of the world. Religiosity can become a God. You know, there's a great emphasis today on the occults. I was asked about it on television today in an interview. Satan worship. People today that are going after all kinds of false spirits across the country and in Europe and in the Far East as well. It's become a big thing and a big business. And many young people across the country are being fooled by all kinds of cults and spirits and devils and demons. Beware. You're dealing with the dark powers that are very real. How did Jesus overcome the devil? By arguing? No. By debating? No. He quoted scripture. The Bible says that he was filled with the Holy Spirit. He was walking according to the will of God. And he quoted the Bible. And every time he quoted the Bible, the devil was defeated. That's the reason it's important to memorize scripture, study the Bible. And I'm so anxious that young people across America now that are finding Christ by the thousands will get into the scriptures, get into the word of God, learn it, desire the sincere milk of the word that ye may grow thereby. Because if you don't, we're going to have a backlash in the next generation. And young people who have had an experience with Christ and don't become taught in the scriptures, are prime targets for the devil. Get into the scriptures. Get to work for Christ. Their rock is not our rock.